this is just that's just a cut control um, but we'll get to that in a second yeah cool uh, so welcome back um we will hopefully try to go a little bit quicker this week um but first off we've got this little activity on uh on understand this is actually quite important it's under how to understand understanding how the current voltage and velocity are involved um so they essentially the you can grab grab your little pens out and draw on it if you applied if you I want you to imagine you're applying, you have a control loop that is able to, oh, that is not flat at all. Hang on. I'm just draw it. You have a control loop that is applying a constant current, which means a constant torque. Okay. So um, now, obviously there is some, some complexity there that we've skipped over by, you know, assuming that we can just give a current and it will reach that current, right? Yep. But we'll just make that assumption. Um, now, I want people who can tell me if we're applying a constant current, we're therefore applying a constant, yeah, and torque, right? Yeah. So what's going to happen to the velocity? Yeah. Yeah, correct. It'll increase. How will it, if the load, the load is zero, how will, it, how will velocity increase? Yeah. Yes, but like how? how Linear, right? So let me change that one. So the so the red is yeah. red is the torque. And then I then our velocity see. our velocity is going to increase linearly. Yeah, okay. Nothing. Um. Okay. So if the velocity is increasing linearly, what is happening to the voltage that we need to apply in order to maintain that constant torque? It's that increasing. Constant. Yep. And how is it increasing? Linearly, because of the back EMF is proportional to the velocity. Bang on. There you go. Okay. So that's, this, this might seem kind of baby steps and very simple. So that's the, that's the velocity there. Oh, sorry, the voltage there. Um, but it's actually really, really important for understanding what's going on later on. Um, because, for example, you can have, you can be applying zero torque, right? When we're running the velocity loops, right, we're going to be varying the torque. You can be applying zero torque. But still have a, a quadrature voltage, right? There's still a non-zero quadrature voltage. Yet there's there is zero current flowing through that motor, and the reason is because the back EMF is generating voltage that's equaling it. Exactly. Let me go for someone. Time, I think. Who is it? Okay, I think we're good. All good. Cool. All right. Uh, does that make sense? Any 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 weirdness about that? All good. Cool. All right. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there is my, uh, how do I clear the annotations? Okay. Uh, so the difference between, so, so you'll have a voltage from the, from the I, right, IR term, and then you'll have a voltage from the velocity. And then, yeah, so technically the voltage probably actually starts a little bit offset, yeah, but anyway, that's a bit semantic, but no, good, good point. Um, now, what happens when the voltage reaches the maximum voltage that we can apply? The velocity reaches the fastest that we can go. Yep. At which point it generates the same back error as the voltage. Yep. Being applied, by which point current drops to zero. Bang on. Real, that's really, really good. Okay, so does everyone understand that? So we increase the voltage, and then and so we, we increase the speed um, until the back EMF equals the maximum voltage we can apply. We have all, we, we're applying as much duty cycle as we can, as much voltage as we can get. The velocity is still creating enough back EMF to exactly equal that, which means that there's no current flowing through the motor, which means we're not generating any more torque, which means we can't travel any faster. So it all kind of, all kind of interlinks and means the same thing. Uh, there's probably a few different approaches to thinking of it, but but yeah, that's that's really good. Glad that, um, yeah. So like, what the voltage of the current? The current. The current. Yeah. Why is that? Because current because the current generates the magnetic field, and the magnetic field generates the magnetic force attraction between the coils and the magnets. Yep. Hell yeah. All right. Cool. So um, a summary of an, a summary summary of yes of last week and just then is these three things. Um, 
so the the three main takeaways are that you've got the two the Clark and Park transforms, and we use the Clark and Park transforms once to convert our currents into uh, into DQ currents and our coil currents into direct and quoted currents. Run those through the control loops, and then we do an inverse Park transform to convert the voltage that the control loop outputs, the D and Q voltage, into alpha and beta voltages. And then the space vector PWM box uh, takes that and converts them to duty cycles. And, and, and this diagram is sort of what how the space vector PWM works. It's not too important if you don't fully understand the space vector PWM because um, all of all of this, all of the inverse park SPWM and, and like GD cycles is contained inside a single block in inside XTC. So we don't actually program it. We just use it. Um, but you do kind of need to understand how it works. Cool. All right. Now we're getting into like a bit of detail. So this is uh, specifically on the VLC. This is the high level schematic for the CMDs, uh, VLCMDs. Um, the key central one here is the microcontroller, which has um, fairly standard interfaces. So there's the CAN interface that goes out to, to the Jetson. Uh, this UART interface is used for the pivots. Um, that's that's the UART that talks to the resolvers on the pivot modules. Um, so that, that UART gets converted into RS485 for those. Um, this SPI out is not used on the uh, on the drive, but it is optionally there if you want, uh, if you have something to SPI talk to. So for example, on the uh, Pac-Man arm board, we use the SPI for the resolver there. Um, although that project never really made it off the ground. Uh, and then we've got the quadrature input. So this is for the encoder signals, for the for the speed control, and also for the for the field oriented control. Um, and then there's some auxiliary sensors. So we've got a sensor there that's measuring the voltage uh, that is coming in, and also a temperature sensor. We don't actually use this either of these really. Uh, I think they're there if someone wants to write code for them. And it's it's off the grabs. Um, now, over to the power stage. So the power stage is the term for the essentially the inverter. So it's what takes the DC voltage and makes it into that the, the squiggly AC voltage that we want. Um, the and we'll get into the details, but there's an SPI communication to the gate driver that controls that. There's also the the six PWM signals that can control the six MOSFETs on the inverter. This IU and IW are the two current measurements, um, and then there's a bunch of other control pins for the gate driver as well. Lastly, down here, there's just voltage regulation. So there's just a, a linear reg on, on there for that. Um, so these things on the actual board, you can see at the top here, the red box there is, is the PIC. Um, you've got the PIC, you've got the CAN transceiver here, um, the programming connector, and let's see, and um, you know, some LEDs and stuff. Um, this, it's a bit hard to see, but this three pin um, connector there is for the, um, is for the, X2C cable, so that it's just a serial connection, but uh, the X2C cable is used for, um, you can actually like read read a lot of the data coming out of the out of the picks um, and really understand the controller behavior. Um, so we use this extensively for tuning of the controller. Um, so yeah, uh, this, so pick and support. So we use this specific pick, um, can probably ask Christos specifically why, but it's got lots of PWMs and ADCs, and it's also quite quick. So it's got, uh, we use 24 kilohertz PWM, and it's got ADCs that can run at 24 kilohertz as well, um, and can do 100, 100 million instructions per second. Um, and it has the quadrature encoding interface, which is very handy. Any questions about uh, the schematic or that? Easy, cool. Um, now, this is X2C. Um, it might look a lot like Simulink. If you've used Simulink, that's because it is a lot like Simulink. It's basically knockoff free Simulink. Um, and it's uh, you can tell that it's knockoff free Simulink as a warning. Um, essentially, what you do is you define imports, which are these green, these green uh, little arrows down here. Um, so these are measurements that you've taken on your system. So uh, one of one of them that we use is the current, another one is the speed, another one is the rotor position, um, for example. Then you've got all these blocks that do all the calculations you want. So you know clock park transforms and control loops and blah blah and you know various other things. And then you've got the outports, which are these ones on the far right, the, the red ones that say out. Um, they are for uh, 
they're sort of exiting X2C and you set them to variables and then you can do stuff with them. So for example, the only outputs in our block diagram are the the PWM duty cycles for the modes. Um, so we we take those and we can save them as variables and then we set them to be the PWM register and duty cycle register in the picks. So if you play with picks, that'll make sense. Um, so yeah, uh, a bit of bit of words. So technically, Scilab, Scilab is a free version of MATLAB, um, and then Xcos is Scilab's version of Simulink, and then X2C is a motor control library within Xcos. Okay, that's a little bit confusing, but when you come to like install all this stuff, you kind of want to understand what what all those things are. Um, I will be doing a recording probably just in my own time on how to install all this shit because it's ridiculous. Um, but yeah, um, cool. So this is the block diagram. We're not going to be going not going to be going into any detail right now, but just in general. Um, oh, go yeah yeah. Uh, where sorry? The very bottom. Um, that is, this is not our diagram. <laughs> Sorry, this is just, yeah. this is just a general like motor control diagram because the extra things you can pick across. So yeah. there's a few, a few different examples. Um, cool. So um, I'm not going to go into detail. You can have a look in your own time if you want, if you can even read it. Um, but essentially, mm -hmm. you've got the outputs on the right. You've got these imports are sort of in the middle. So these these ones are the, the rotor position and the currents. Then this one is the velocity of the motor. And then this one is the position for the, for the resolver. Um, and then as a general flow, this, this loop here is the current control loop. Then this loop out to here is the velocity loop. And then this loop out here is the, is the position. So, so the current control loop adjusts voltages to generate torque. The velocity control loop adjusts torque to reach a desired speed. And the position control loop adjusts speeds to reach a desired position. Um, so yes, um, Xcos is really annoying to use, but it does work. Um, there is a MATLAB version that uses Simulink, but it costs 4,000 euros. Mm -hmm. um, so we didn't do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Um, so it might look sort of familiar if you've done uh, MCC stuff, but the X2C library is essentially a module within, uh, within sorry, the X2C library is a module within MCC, which is the MATLAB, uh, sorry, the microchip code configurator. Um, within this, you define, you, you, you click open and that brings up the X2C model. So you can adjust all your blocks and stuff. Um, and then you click this reload IO bar button and that, that looks in your model, finds all the imports and outputs and puts them. In. So you can see here, we've got the imports for angle, current and output position, etc. Um, and this stuff here, this is the X2C scope that I was talking about. So, uh, actually there's, there's two things going on. So, so the first one here is the interrupt to call the X2C model. So what this means is um, essentially the, the X2C model gets executed repeatedly. And in our case, it gets executed 24,000 times a second um, and does different, and then uh, that, that's more or less it. So, and it, so that's the control, the current control updating. Um, and you need an interrupt to start that. Uh, so this is triggered off the ADC interrupt. And so the way it works is we, at uh, at a set frequency, we we tell the ADC to start doing a measurement, which takes a finite time. Right? It, you can't instantly get an ADC value. It takes it takes a couple of microseconds for it to to do the measurement, and then and then when the ADC is finished, then that triggers the X2C code to run the the, the block just once. Just once. Okay. Yeah. ADC what? Uh, the currents. So the on the on the field oriented control. Yeah. So what's the ADC yeah. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. The, the uh, yeah. Uh, so um, I, I probably explained this before, but might as well just say it again. That we only measure two currents because it's a remember the motor is a Y. So if we can measure two of the currents, we can just add them together and or take the difference or whatever to get the third one. Makes sense. Mm. Cool. Yeah. Lastly, is this communication? This is the X2C scope. So this is what lets us see the numbers that are running in in the uh, in the controller. But you can imagine because we're running this twenty four thousand times a second. If we were like printing all the values, it'd be a little bit hard to tell what's going on. Uh, so this puts it into essentially graphs for us, which is really nice. So the, and that, that's just telling 
which which interface on the pick to talk through and how many data values to send. So it sends 5,000 per file. Cool. Um, here's the file structure. This is just, so there's a lot of files. Um, you can blame me for this, but Christos was going to do it in one file and I said no. Uh, <laughs> um, so um, there's sort of three different categories. So there's the files in with the red box around them. They're ones that we wrote. Um, these are mostly sort of driver, like uh, like hardware wrappers, I guess. Um, so things like CAN, Quadrature Interface, Resolver Interface, uh, stuff like that. There is a few others, you know, like the config and the core control. Um, uh, core control is probably the main one that's important. Um, then there's the MCC generated files in green. So these are, if you've done a PIC project, you'll know what these are. These are sort of generated by MCC and, and the, the lowest level software wrapper for all the hardware interfaces. And then there's the X2C code, which is in there in there one more deeper. Um, that's English. Um, mm -hmm. And essentially, these are these are like what we interface with. Um, the only one that matters is X2C main. The X2C main is what the it, there's a there's a there's a function in there called X2C main, um, and that is what the ADC interrupt calls. Okay. Um, again, we'll go into more detail later, but just sort of getting this general idea of how the structure works uh, to begin with. Uh, we've got a, a few interrupts, there's four. Um, PWM interrupt and then the ADC interrupts. I'm um, just letting you know. Uh, don't worry about it too much. Uh, and then this is what I was describing about the program flow. So this is our, so on the left, we've got the main. This is literally like main.c, your, your typical typical C file. Um, is a bit of initialization and, and all that sort of stuff that's pretty typical for picks. Um, and then in the while loop, there's an X2C communicate function. Um, and that can function is just so no, essentially continuously, the pick will be getting the, getting all the data from X2C, sending it to my, the, your computer, and also looking at your computer and say, hey, you got anything and, and doing that. Doing that. Now this is actually in a while loop and it's running continuously. It'll it, this could run ten times in a row, hundred times in a row, and then it gets interrupted by the XTC main, right? So in this this PWM generator callback, this this is what triggers the ADC to start. So this it, it's kind of weird, I know, but the yeah. So the, the PWM generator when it is at the start of its cycle, it will start the ADC conversion. And then when the ADC conversion is finished, that triggers that interrupt. And you can see a few things happen. I wish I made this text a little bit bigger, apologies. Um, the first one is update imports. So what update imports does is it looks at all those green arrows on the XGC model, it gets all that data. So it gets, um, actually no, technically it has that data. Our update imports gets the info, gets the data and sends it to the XGC model, right? So it gets the currents and it gets the rotor position, gets the velocity position and sends that to the XGC model. Um, and, and you don't actually have to update anything within that function. You just, uh, why is that true? No, you do. Yeah, sorry. So the update imports, all, all that's in the function is like this horrible struct that X2C creates and you say it equals this value and that's it. Um, so you just do that for all those. Um, we're clearing the interrupts, which is pretty standard. Then we do X2C update, which takes the imports, progresses them through all of your blocks in your model uh, until you and then generates the output values. And then there's update outports where we get the values from those red outports and we set them to be what we want like, to actually do something. So in our case, we get the ADC values and we actually set them to in the PWM generators for the ADC. Um, and then we've also got this check and send telemetry, telemetry thing, which um, just grabs telemetry data and sends it where we can. Does that make sense? No. no. Cool. So, uh, I love that. The top right block is, yeah, it's a little bit confusing. That basically, whenever the PWM, the, the PWM generator is actually the thing that starts this off. Um, so the PWM generator is basically like, I'm ready to go. And then it, and says, okay, ADC, you start measuring the current. Then, and, and that's all it does. And then the ADC goes, okay, I've measured the current. And then it tells, okay, uh, X2C, you can start doing all your work. Cool. 
Yeah. And then you should be both of these blocks run, like the top one runs and then the bottom one runs. The triggered by interrupt. Right? Yeah, so the, the PWM, the PWM interrupt is triggered whenever the PWM starts. So like, so whenever, whenever it like cycles, right? And then the ADC one will, will happen immediately after that. This left block, block of code runs asynchronously and just is continuously running in the background and gets interrupted by these two. So mm -hmm. the top one gets interrupted by the PWM. Yeah. Yeah. Starts the bottom one. Exactly. So it's like PWM. Yeah. Starts XGC. Yeah. And, and this just runs in all the space. Yeah. Yeah. So it's very important that your code runs quick enough so that it doesn't eat up the entire period of the duty of, of the theory. Yeah. So do you want to know how many instructions it, it, it is that time? 4,096. So you have 4,000 machine instructions to do everything. Uh, we just we just wrote it and hope for the best. But in theory, you could always lower the PWM cycle. Thank you, you cycle, right? Um, we run it that high so it's out of human hearing because otherwise it would squeal. Yeah, yeah, 24 kilohertz is out. Is almost like 20 is pretty much the max. Yeah, so unless you're so like if you have your dog around, I might not like. Anyway. Excuse communicate gets all the telemetry from the from like the imports and outputs and even the values inside the blocks and it sends it over camp. Oh, sorry, it sends it over the, the that, that UART cable that we sometimes plug into the Dell TMDs so that we can plot them on the computer. If it's not plugged in. It doesn't do anything. At the beginning of the part, yeah. Yeah. It so like, there's a, there's a bit going on in there. It it actually like is a session based thing with the computer. Like they actually like talk and interact and and do weird things. I have no idea how it works, okay. but it's it's very cool. Um, it's very very handy. Is there a kind? Of... Yeah. Um, why did you choose the only two of the two parts for the same wire? Basically, you don't. You just you. There's no need to because and and in fact the the blocks the the clock transform block in in XGC and it has two inputs. Yeah, or the inverse clock or whatever, whichever. Yeah. One. And you can configure which of the three coils that is, or you have to. Yeah. Use... Now you, yeah, you have to be a little bit careful when you're like matching your coils with your duty cycle and stuff like that. Yeah. But okay, that'll come later. All right. Uh, this is just a slide to demonstrate that shit's complicated. Okay. You will. We will need to jump around between the code, the PCB, the schematic, the XGC model, and MCC and interrupts as well all the time um, in order to fully understand what's going on. All right, um, this, I'm gonna skip through a lot of it because we have touched on that last week, but how do we spin a motor? Uh, we need to put sinusoidal current through the motor, essentially, if it's spinning at a constant speed, right? Mm -hmm. um, yep, now, this is sort of the interesting thing I wanna talk about. So if we apply a sinusoidal volt, the, 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 gen generally, if you wanted to apply a sinusoidal current, you would apply a sinusoidal voltage at each of the nodes, and that would be your sinusoidal current. And this is what we do with AC motors, right? That plug into the grid. Um, and so on this top graph, this is this is the voltage at each node. So those A, B, and C nodes. And then this bottom graph is the voltage between nodes. Okay. So subtly different. Yeah. So A to C, A to B, and B to C, right? Um, so you can see that when we apply 10 volts AC at each at each node, we get about 17.3 volts. On, on the difference between the clocks. So my question is, is there a way to get more? Right? Because we've got we've got 20, like we've got 20 volts here, right? And plus or minus 10. So what can we do better? Short answer is yes. Um, this thing is called a satellite form. It looks really funky, yes, because it is. Um, but you'll notice that when we plot the difference between the voltages on the bottom one, that that turquoise line, we're getting nearly 20 volts. So we're getting, and I mean it's only like 2.5 volts more or whatever. But it is noticeable. Um, and this is the difference between sinusoidal PWM and space vector PWM. 
in essence, is this this satellite bomb. Um, so, yeah, uh, I'm not going to go into detail. There's a video there that's actually quite good on how it works, and there's also a video I've sent on the next slide. Um, however, just so you understand what the satellite waveform is, it's just a sinusoid where the center tap voltage varies as a triangle. Hmm. Okay. This guy here? Yeah. Yeah. So that little blue, that, that this little blue dot, that voltage oh. varies as this, this triangle wave. So last week, Matt was asking, can we treat it as, you know, a, a balanced Y network when we're analyzing it? And I said, kind of, but you'll see next week that we can't, and it's for this reason. Um, yeah. In practice, it doesn't matter because we're not analyzing it as an AC network. We're analyzing it as a, because of all the Clark and Park transforms, it becomes like a linear system. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, um, you can do a lot of research on this, but if you've done 3073, it's similar to overmodulation in of a inverter. Um, I mean, sorry? 3073. Oh, sorry, not 3073. What is it? Power systems. Yeah. Whatever. Anyway. Whatever it is. I don't know why I'm referring to it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, um, I know you're going to have a lot of questions about this. But I'm not going to stick around on this, but I'll give you one. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry. I don't understand it that well either. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't matter. Uh, because the current is dependent on the on the point between nodes, right? So if we apply some voltage at this node and apply some voltage at that node, the current will be proportional to that. Right? Cool. All right. Sorry, I'm not. Uh, and here's here's another thing. One thing that I sort of didn't talk about with SB PWM is that the PWM signals are all what's called center aligned, right? So because we've got three. Um, instead of them all rising at the same time and then going, one goes for 20%, one goes for 50%, one goes for 70%, and then falling, they're all center aligned. And that's very critical for the way that this works. Um, again, I don't know the details because it's just a block. Anyway, but there's another video there where I stole these pictures from. Uh, but you can see as, as this arrow rotates, if, if you open that video, as this arrow rotates, the duty cycles will expand and contract. Um, and that's from... Yeah, I'm probably doing it a bit of a disservice, but you know, yes, I'm sure that some very smart guys have written some very complex paper. All right, uh, so here's the inverter, um, which is pretty straightforward. Right. Anyway. Um, so the um, essentially there's three um, three half bridges, so six MOSFETs. Um, we apply a a PWM signal to one side and the inverse of that signal to the top. So one, one and inverted to the top and bottom. Um, and this gives us the, the output. Is that, is that cool? This is sort of, we sort of touched on this with the SP PWM. Yeah, right. So it's, it's exactly the same, but we're just sort of being specific that we're talking about these six MOSFETs instead of just magical floating gates. Mm. Um, so yeah, the middle voltage is either the, the middle node here, like these UV and Ws, is either exactly connected to battery voltage or exactly connected to ground. It's never it's never halfway, right? However, because of the inductance of the okay, uh, of the wire the wires, right? The um, the current is averaged, and therefore you can kind of treat it as this current is averaged, and if we pretend it's resistive then the voltage is kind of bad, but it's not, okay. Right? Yeah. Does that make sense? Anyway, that's not that important, but it's important to realize that we're never actually applying half the voltage of them, we, but we can apply half the duty cycle, right? And they're slightly distinct things. Okay. No. In fact, you, 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 the, yeah, the inductor smooths the current. Uh, we do we do smooth the voltage on the input side with the with that big capacitor, and that's to prevent brownouts. Um, and it also does some things with inverters. If you study inverters in power systems, you'll understand how that works. 
Um, cool, we've seen that slide before. And yeah, so this is what I was talking about. So we we with PWM the voltage and the the current kind of goes up and down. And so the faster you do your PWM, the the smaller your current. Rate. All right, cool. So the next part of the schematic is the gate driver. Um, so the gate driver itself is is this chip in the top right corner, TMC sixty one hundred. Um, it's the QFN monster with a lot of pins. Um, and on the schematic, it's this one down here. And you can see if we think back to the top level schematic from before, we've got the six PWM inputs coming in here. Uh, this fault pin, this SPI communication, and this these mode select and enable. Um, so that's how it interfaces. Um, and the gate driver does a lot of things. So it, it it has a bootstrap circuit. So what a bootstrap circuit does is it it generates a really high voltage to send to the the gate of the top side MOSFET because they're all n-channel MOSFETs. So if your if your n-channel MOSFET is trying to switch battery voltage, so 30 volts, you need to then put the gate at say 12 volts higher than battery voltage in order to get it to turn on, right? Um, so that's what the bootstrap circuit does. Um, you, you can look up how those work. There's also a brief explanation in the CMD workshop I did. The other thing it does is this thing called, uh, uh, what's it called? It's called break before make logic, where the high and the low side, so you have the, the two PWM signals per half bridge, right? Now, if you turn both of those MOSFETs on at the same time, you will get a short circuit from battery to ground and you'll blow your MOSFETs up. Not good. Okay, so what the gate driver does is it monitors both of the signals, and it it won't let it won't let the high one go high until the low one's gone low, right? And vice versa. That's it's as simple as that. Um, it also when it's when it for the gates of the MOSFETs, it it provides a really high current in and out of the gate, so it actually pushes current in, but like pushes charge in and pulls charge out of the gate, um, and that helps it turn on really quickly and turn off really. quickly. Um, so if you remember the model of a MOSFET is the gate is a capacitor, right? So we want to push in as much charge as we can as quickly as possible and pull out. Um, you can see that in, on the schematic here for the half bridge, there's some, Christos has got some notes here about the, the miller charge of 10 to 20 nanofarads for this, this, uh, this MOSFET. And so we actually use this resistor here to, uh, to sort of tune the the like the impedance of oh, yeah. that to make sure it doesn't like spike or or like resonate or anything like that. That's there's something to think about as well. Um, and it also detects faults. So if you've ever heard me say gate driver fault, this is what I'm talking about. So the gate driver will pull that. Uh, will, who's that? Um, the gate driver will pull that volt that fault pin high if anything goes wrong. So one of them is like if if the like I don't know, I don't actually don't know what gates, what faults it triggers. But if anything's going bad with like the voltages on the output, it'll tell you that. Oh, um, uh, yeah, sorry. If anything's going wrong with like, uh, well, it actually. So, it, what one thing to note is that the gate, the gate driver actually. So it, it sends the signals to the high and low side bits, right? Yeah. But it also monitors the the voltage that is being create yeah um so yeah at the, at the middle there and it does that for two reasons one it's monitoring it but it also uses that voltage for the bridge trust right um so it needs it needs to have a connection to that so you can see here we've got for every very half bridge there's the high side low side and this sw pin which i don't know what it stands for but uh, i'm sure there's a good name um and, and then you can see the capacitor from the sw line for the gate for the bridge trust. <laughs> Um, yeah, so no, they're normal MOSFETs, yeah. So, I mean, with they're normal, but like they have a very low on resistance, um, to improve efficiency. So, yeah, um, and then yeah, we've just got the output there for and that goes eventually to the, the motor, the motor itself, yeah, exactly. Just there, yeah, yeah. So, that, those outputs come out here to the motor itself, and you can also see out of, out of these blocks. Out of two of them is other sense resistors, not on this one. Because I think. Um, yeah. Okay. So a bit more detail on the gate driver. Um, like I said, PWM prevents shoot through logic, fault pin, done that. Uh, the SPI stuff is for actually configuring the gate driver. So you need to configure things like the charge current on the MOSFET gates. And uh, that's kind of it. I don't think we actually use a lower configuration because we don't care that much. 
Um, you also need to clear faults if they occur. So mm -hmm. if we, but we also don't need to do that because when we have a gate driver fault, we just reset the entire, um, the entire BLCND, um, through over CAN, right? Like when we send it the, the reset command and in the initialization, it, it clears any faults in the gate driver. Um, it's a good question. It, it's stuff like short detection. So if it, if, if it detects that like two of the coils are connected together for some reason, stuff like that, it'll, it'll trigger. Um, you can have a look in the data sheet for it if you want specifics. Um, so just the third box. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's not actually measuring. The yeah. I think, uh, again, have a look in the data sheet. Um, that might not actually be true, but yeah. Um, I'm so sorry. When you said second, yeah, we, we reset the microcontroller and yeah. that then reinitializes it. True. True. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it also, when it turns on, it has to set this enable pin. Yep. So the, the gate driver will not turn on unless you have this high. Um, so that's actually how it resets, is when the pick resets, that pin goes low, and it turns up again, and that completely resets again. Oh, so it resets everything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so there's two ways of um, controlling the gate driver. Um, oh, yeah. So so one, so yeah. So this I, I drive is the gate driving current that I was talking about earlier. So that's one of the parameters you can configure in the uh, over SBI. And there's also this single um over SPI. Over SPI. Yeah. Uh or both. so both. Yes. Yeah. So see the that SPE pin with the mode select, the second one from the bottom. That yeah, that that is a pin that toggles between whether you are configuring it over SPI or configuring it with pin drops. Yeah. So if you could and, and we do it over SPI, I'm I'm pretty sure. We definitely did it on the on the Pac-Man board because we didn't have a removed that 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 SP, SPE pin was just called high, or whichever one is SPI mode. Um, so you can see that a lot of these have two different names. So there's like SCK underscore I drive one. So that's the that is the SPI clock, but it's also I drive one depending on which mode. You're in, right. Um, this single. So one of the things you can do is is this single. So there's the SDO or single pin for that, or you can configure an SPI. The single is instead of using two PWMs for every half bridge, you can set. Uh, a, you can use a single PWM which controls the duty cycle and then a separate pin that tells you whether it's high or low. Uh, but this was just, it was easy to do it this way with, with our setup. Um, oh boy. Okay. There's a lot of code here. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but the, this, this stuff here is essentially the code that talks to the gate driver. So we're setting the CS pin, exchanging bytes of data with it, reading bytes of data from it, writing bytes of data to it. And then, here is the main initialization for the, the gate driver. So this set gconf, um, and you can see all these things. So, so there's a pit, there's a bit that disables the driver. There's a bit that does that single line mode I was talking about. Uh, there's a bit that tells you, uh, how the fault, something about the fault. And that's about it. Normal operation. Yeah. So anyway, we need to essentially set it to be enabled. So we set, uh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Set fault direct and set so fault direct single line and disable to zero. So that's what that is. And then we or it with one for some reason. I can't remember. Uh, and we set it and we, we send that over SPI. Um, so this is the initialization. So we, we do the gate driver set config and then we, uh, and we, we that's in a while loop to check that it worked. So it just continuously does that until it doesn't work, until it does work. Um, how does the like execution model impact the like, like it does on the yeah the so uh, we will so we don't it doesn't actually interact directly with the gate driver it, the X2C our code takes the outputs and it sets the PWM module in the pick it sets the duty cycle of that and those six PWM signals go to the gate driver okay. yeah in okay. fact that might be like the next slide. Um, cool. Here's the inverter on the PCB. So that's the gate driver we've been loving for all this time. And then there's the six MOSFETs. So you can see that like uh, in between each MOSFET, there's this like 
there's like the high side and then there's the ground side and then there's the in-between side and these two gray rectangles these are the current sensor resistors so these are actually like copper colored in real life um, so the, the the power goes through this through the signal and out to the w connection for the motor and then through this out for the v and through this out to the v. um so here's what i was talking about Tash. um so the the outputs from the XTC model are signed 16-bit integers. So um, that's something to keep in mind. But the duty cycles are unsigned inputs, right? And they go from 0 to 4096. That, that 0 to 4096 is a function of how many clock cycles there are available in the period that the duty, uh, that, they, uh, that the PWM is running. So because we're running it so quickly, we can only get 4096 bits of resolution in the so that has a 96 resolution in the PWMC, in the GDC. Right. Yeah. Sorry, that was a bit hand waved. Um, but they're, essentially, they're 13 bits, right? So we get a 16 bit signed number. We add 7 FFF to it to make it a signed, sorry, an unsigned number that goes from 0 to 32768 instead of from negative 16,000 to positive 16,000. Then we so that's that's what these are. So so we, so this this here, this XGC model outputs B duty cycle U, duty cycle B, duty cycle W. They're the outputs. Yeah. So right, we get those. So it's just some horrible struct pointer thing. You'll get used to it if you're using it. We had seven FFF to it, and then we bit shift it to the right three times to make it fit in this thirteen bit. Cool. And these these PGD PG three DC are the the PWM generator three seven and five duty cycle versions. Um, one thing to note is that zero on the output, so duty cycle, so duty U zero, mean in in a, from an XGC point of view means I want zero, like I want zero volts on there. So hang on, let me take a step back. So in XGC land, you've got zero volts, positive volts, and negative volts. But in BLCMD land, we've got zero volts, middle voltage, and battery voltage. Right. So it, it's not centered around zero volts. It's centered around the Okay, so zero on the output corresponds to zero volts, which is actually fifty percent duty cycle, right? Because you've got half of it, half the time it's connected to plus voltage, and half the time it's connected to negative voltage. Mm -hmm. On average, you get zero zero net current. Plus oh, one. Yeah. So that's why you have the yeah yeah. Mm. Alex, why is it like that when they say why do it like you may not change it? Um. It just is. It's not that confusing once you're embedded because once you've got this set up, you don't need to touch it. Yeah. Right. So yeah. you you just then you just embed yourself in XTC land and it's like positive and negative numbers. Yeah. Um. So. Yeah. It's in XTC. Yeah. The red the red outputs so are XTC. So that kind of makes more sense in XTC because then you have. I agree. The positive yeah. and negative kind of implies a direction. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah I guess that makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> so it, it does. It does. I guess like it more like voltage and it implies that the like opposite direction. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um. So yeah. So the consequence of that is the plus one on the output is 100% duty cycle on the high side MOSFET, and current is flowing, and a negative one is 100% duty cycle on the low side, which means current flows the other. So, uh, so when, uh, when it's high, when it's when the high side is on, current's going out. When the low side is on, current's going. Yeah. Uh, uh, to, with all the DQ frames and stuff, it gets a bit more complicated. But but all you need to know is that hmm, is this. Is the positive and negative one right? Yeah. So plus yeah. one on the output in X C. That yes, that is off. Yeah, that, so that is connect. So negative one is the MOSFET is con the the half bridge is connected to ground. Positive one is the MOS the half bridge is connected to battery voltage, and and zero is the half bridge is connected to half volt. Fifty percent duty cycle, half voltage. But mm -hmm. remember, the voltage is not half, yeah. but it's half current. So fifty percent of the time yeah. So it, when so quick quick question. When we're on fifty this person, when we're on fifty percent duty cycle, how much current is flowing through the half bridge? Through the half bridge. Zero. Through the half. Yeah. Cool. 
because the, the half of the center are tapped in the exactly. Thing. Yeah, no, that's that's bang on. Um, cool. Um, back into MCC land we go. So duty cycle. This is just an explanation of where things are. We set the this duty cycle, and you'll notice it's twenty four point four kilohertz with these little extra numbers here. That is so that one cycle is forty point nine six microseconds, which is four thousand and ninety six clock cycles. That's just Christoph's liking on <laughs> <how it's okay. laughs> um, You probably don't have to do it like that, but you know it is, it is kind of elegant. Um, and then uh, it, this drop down has has three different drop downs for Pitot and three, five, and seven. Um, you've got to turn them on. You've got to set them to be center aligned, um, and that's about it. Why is it three five? Is just um, like it's just yeah, yeah. What's the center aligned? Center aligned is um, this. So oh, all the yes. all the do yeah. Love it when I can just show a picture. All right, cool. So um, I probably should have made these a bit bigger, but anyway, <laughs> I'm going to step this through with my mouse very very slowly. Maybe, or it might just, okay. this is going uh, to be I that. Uh, where? Oh, that one. Ah, sick. Yep. Is that good? All right, cool. So, okay, so we can see here we've got um, the three inputs. So the first one here is current. Two, second one is current one, and the third one is the angle in. So the angle in is is the measurement coming from the encoder on the rotor that tells you the position of the rotor. And they're just integers. Actually, do I need to do this now? No, we do it in way more detail. Okay, cool. This is just a summary slide. We're good. Um, anyway, so all all I will describe at this point is that we run this current loop at twenty four point four one four kilohertz, and that that sort of is in this general area. And then the velocity loop is one eighth of that, so it runs at three thousand two hertz. Um, so we, so for every, and and there's a reason you do this. It's so that you have enough time for your change in current to stabilize before you then update the current target, right? Because every time the velocity loop runs, we're going to update the current target. So we we want to update, give it eight cycles to figure out to actually get there, and then update it again, and then watch. Is that like a microscope? Uh it? No, it's sort of a stable, yeah, it's a stability and control system. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, so, yeah, again, this slide repeated. But so here is the SVPWM uh, and, and the rest in, um, in X2C land. So we feed in, on the left-hand side here, you can see these two arrows here are D and Q. We feed in the DQ voltage. And this block, it does, it's a beautiful, it does, it does the inverse clock, inverse clock, and the SVP, SVPWM for us. Yeah. And it outputs, <laughs> it, outputs, it outputs the ABC duty cycles. Okay. And then you'll notice we've got these blocks here. These are just rate limiters. They may not be required anymore, but we had them there sort of as a safety thing so that the so that it, the XGC model can't change the output voltage too quickly. The rate limit is like very, very, very short. It's like it's probably like microseconds or something. I can't remember. Um, but but it's it's essentially just to, so it can't go from zero to one hundred in like like a microsecond because we were having brownout issues. However, they may have been due to other. Um, so, but they're just sort of there now as a safety because the there should be no reason that we need to change the clock. That's just changing. Yeah, it's just correct. It's just sloping. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, maybe later. We we regarding the brands, we never figured out exactly why they were happening. Sort of catch them, but there have been things we have fixed later on that may have fixed the problems of brownouts. That we haven't gone back to try and create generate brownouts again by deleting all these random blocks because it's worth having them here anyway, just as a safety thing. Oh, a brownout is like the the current spikes so hard that you're the voltage, the main voltage, droops and causes the pick to turn off. Yeah, yeah. Um, you'll also see that 
yeah so these these little squares here this is like the right limit initialize so that tells that tells the right limiter what value to output initially when it turns on like when 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 the model starts and then there's and then this gd cycle rate limiter enable enables the rate limit so that's actually off right now so maybe they're not even doing anything i don't know yeah this is <laughs> um the other thing that's important is um actually there's another slide on that so you'll you'll see there's this home enable and home form home force voltage we'll come back to that um actually no it's here so this forced mode this this forced mode and forced value thing this is very important for the way that our foc works because it lets us home the motor so you know, you know when we turn everything on they all like click and they home to like package. what this does is it overrides the inputs so when when home enable is on it overrides the dq and theta inputs just ignore them and it sets uh it sets theta to zero and energizes the direct voltage um i think yeah. Something like that. Um, the exact details aren't that important, but you can read about it in the docs for the block. The docs for the block are kind of shit, just a heads up. But we, so, and, and this home force voltage is what percentage duty cycle we energize that with. Right. So here it's 0.05%, and that's chosen very deliberately because the motor is effectively stalling when you do this. So the current, yep. so if we send, if we did one, we would put 30 volts across this, like, I don't know, three ohm motor. And you would get you get a huge spike of yeah. Well, it's sort of right. It's it's locking in one direction. So so all the currents coming out of one coil and the two currents going in. Yeah, it's like that. Correct. It's one it's one of the SV failure in directions. Yeah. But yeah, anyway, you want to make sure that's very low because um you don't want to burn your motor out and you want to keep it short. Um, so they only do it for like half a second. That is five percent. Yeah. So all of the numbers in XGC go from zero to one. Um, actually, no. That's all the numbers in XGC go from minus one to one, um, except some of them are signed. So, so, so <laughs> some of them are unsigned. But, but more or less, everything is minus one. To one. Um, so, and so this, um, this is, yeah. And then with the buffer control, then change that value to zero. Exactly. Yeah, so later on, once it's after that time has passed, the in the core control we disable that. Okay. Um, in fact, there's yeah, yeah. And the high Yes. So so for example, so we so what we do is we home and then we set the angle in the field oriented control, right? That 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 theta parameter that controls the Clark path transforms. We set that, we home and we set that to be zero. Mm -hmm. Um and what happens is if you home and your, for example, your motor shaft is like completely broken and it, and it doesn't connect mechanically to the encoder or you have grub screw issues and they don't connect properly. You home and say, so, so ideally you home and your motor and encoder move together. But if they don't and your motor moves like this and your encoder stays still, then it, it resets, right? And then it tries to move and all of a sudden zero, zero degrees isn't zero degrees anymore. And what that can mean in the worst case is that the positive, positive Q current is actually so when x2c is trying to apply positive q current it's actually applying negative q current right if, if you're if you're so far out if you're over 180 degrees out of alignment right then then because because the encoder is well it's it's because the it it homes and the encoder is like I'm, I'm here but it but it's actually at 180 degrees right so so if if you imagine if you imagine it's it's trying to generate a torque this way, but it's so far out of alignment that it's now trying to generate a torque this way. So it spins the wrong way, right? And when you run a velocity loop on that, the velocity loop's going, all right, we're too slow. I want to increase the torque, right? Increase the torque, torque goes negative, and that completely fucks everything, right? So very important that your homing works properly and that your mechanical support for it is good, um, in short. The FOC is that entire DQ current control loop. Idea. It's called field oriented oh. control. Okay. Um, so speaking of encoders, um, yeah. hopefully some of this is familiar to a few of you. Um, we've got a bit going on, but if, if you haven't heard of differential uh, encoders, you've got this A and B signal that, depending on the order, 
you can tell if it's going, if you, well, the pulses, you can tell if it's going one way, this, um, yeah, so if one rises before the other, it's going one way, if the other rises first, it's going. Um, so, uh, we also do what's called differential, uh, signaling. So we, for each of these A and B signals, we send the original copy and an inverted copy from the motors to the BLCMDs. Um, and that just helps with noise immunity. And it means that our, uh, number of steps is very consistent. I will, I will finish this slide. Just quickly, I'll get through this and then uh we'll head off. So um this this encoder that, so we use this AMT10 and then we solder the, the Ethernet connector onto it with the line driver. Um and this 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 AMT10 has 1024 pulses per revolution, um, which is equivalent to 8192 edges per revolution. So so each pulse has two edges and there's uh so each each cycle uh, has four edges in it. Uh, between the A and the B. Oh, right. So, it's, so it's, sorry, it's, it's, it's 1024 pulses per line per revolution, which is 8,192 8, edge, edge transitions between both lines. Now, the, the reason why we talk about edges is because that's how we handle it in the quadrature interface for the Yeah. Okay. Um, so we, we now on the, on the board here, there's the Ethernet connector. Those differential signals run through this line receiver, which is the, the chip there, and get converted into just the A and B signals. Um, and then they go into the peak directly. And that's just the Correct. Yeah, you just, uh, it's actually adding, no, yeah, taking the difference. Yeah, sorry. Um, between the A and the A complement signal for the, for the differential. Yeah. Uh, now, the tricky part of this is that. We need the electrical position. Remember last week I was talking about the mechanical angle and the electrical angle. That is that is where this comes into play, right? So because we've got seven magnetic cycles per mechanical cycle on the drive motors, and we've got twenty-two magnetic cycles per per mechanical cycle on the new pivot motors. What do you mean by that? Sorry? Is that electrical is in so? It's it's because there's multiple magnets. So it's it's because a an ideal motor, right, is just this, right? Three yeah. three poles and a so one magnet pair pole and three coil poles, right? Yeah. But where our motors are more like this, where we've got like twenty magnet twenty magnet pairs and like however many coils and something. Like right. So, yeah. seven? so on the drive motors we have seven magnetic right. so, yeah. cycles okay. per yeah. so Essentially, if we were to do one, if we were to do one mechanical cycle of the motor, one three sixty degree rotation. Yeah, we would have to do seven full electrical cycles, right? Where we where we do that full sign that that saddle PWM pattern seven seven times in yeah. in that one. Yeah. You know, so the point is that if we want to get the electrical position of the rotor, we need to um do some trickery, right? Because yeah. all we all we are measuring is the mechanical position. Yeah. The, the the electric position will be what angle within that electrical cycle you're within. Yeah. Um so the way you do this, you you can figure this out on your own if you're bored, but this is how you do it. You multiply it by seven, or in the case of the pivots, you multiply it by twenty two, which is what we call this E to M ratio, electrical to me to mechanical ratio. Um, the POS1 CNTL, that's the, that is the number of, that is the angle, essentially the angle of the, um, of the encoder. The mechanical. Yeah, mechanical angle. So that, that, that goes from zero to 8,191. Um, we multiply by seven and then we modulo divide by the EPR, which is edges per revolution. So that's 8,192. And then we bit shift that to the left by three. Uh, no, sorry, this, sorry, I spoke, I spoke incorrectly. This does not vary from zero to eight one nine one. I 
question. I can't remember. Anyway, this is how it works. This this number is a is a signed integer that goes from negative seven f to positive seven. Yeah. Well, or eight thousand for one. Um, worth noting that if we wanted to, we could have used AMT elevens or AMT thirty ones, which have the differential signal built in, but they were out of stock when we went to do this. So that's mm -hmm. why we came up with this pants with the encoders. Any confusion about this? It's a little bit hand wavy, but yeah, you understand why we need to do it. Yep. Yeah, so we've got the A and B, A and B signals from the encoder that go through that on the on the pants here, which are soldered to the motor, go through a line driver, which gives you the original A and B signal and an inverted A and B signal. They go through the Ethernet cable up through the suspension and into the BLC MD. Those four signals come into this line receiver, which um, takes the difference from the A complement and the A and the B complement and the B and gives you just back your A and B signal. And the reason we do this is for noise immunity. They go directly into the pick. Um, and so as the encoder rotates, the pick is counting how many pulses it receives and, and it's done in a cumulative way. So it counts, I've received 10 pulses forward, one pulse back, I'm now at nine, right? Um, and be and well, sorry, it actually doesn't count the pulse, it counts the edge, to be clear. So it, yeah. Um, and whenever it reaches 8192, it resets to zero. So that keeps it in in the right range of numbers. Yeah. Correct. Yep. And it's mechanically. Oh. Yeah. So that what value is multiplied by seven. The that that number from the count from the quadrature encoder out of eight thousand one hundred. Yeah. Out of eight thousand one hundred. So okay. So and then we so okay yeah so so we multiply that eight thousand one hundred ninety two by seven or twenty two we get some you know, relatively large number. And then we do the modulo division, which gives us the remainder after we divide by 8,192. So that, that means that the number we're left with is between zero and 8,192. Yeah? Yeah. Now, 8,192 is a 13-bit number. Yeah. So in order to make it a 16-bit number, we need to bit shift it to the left by three. And that makes it a 16 bit number. And then we cast it as a signed integer, which is what these round brackets around the N16 are doing. And we pump it into the XTC stuff. Yeah. And then just cast it as the same XTC. Yeah, because XTC, as I said before, it takes numbers from minus one to one yeah. or minus. Now, the thing that's weird so in, in XTC, all the numbers will be represented as points, right? That will be minus one to one, but they actually are signed ins. Cool. Um, so, okay. so so like so like when so when it's saying when it's saying like plus point eight, it's actually saying uh, I can't do maths in my head, but like eighty percent of sixteen thousand per minute. Right? Yeah. Wait, is that conversion like a function you have for this software or is that the... no no I'm just talking like visually when it's showing you data on the XQC communicate graph, mm -hmm. it it um so like on that might be an example. Maybe. Yeah, like on these graphs, right? It all of the, this this is these are just the currents and velocities, right? Don't worry yet. But but the all of these in the the values that we have set in the model are signed integers. But when it shows it to us in these graphs, they are from zero to one. So okay. negative one. And if that's just because it doesn't have the rest of time. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't have that information. It's just yeah, it's yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you've got to make sure that you're scaling things correctly so that it can it can both reach and it can reach the values that you want it to. Right? Because if you had configured it so that the the maximum voltage was sixty volts, but you can only you can only give thirty volts, then you've got a problem. Right? Yeah. Um, cool. And then this slide is about how we zero the rotor, which um, is a little bit more complex than what I showed before. <laughs> I forgot about this. This is this is how it's done on on so th this is how it's done in the in the Pac-Man board. 
the, the original one. And this is how it's done on the VLC MDs. And because Christos likes this sequencer thing, which is sort of controls the turn on sequence of each of the loops. The right now? No, this sequencer okay. down here. The sequence okay. down here, it turns on turns on all the things in sequence. Yeah. So the first the first thing it does is it this there's this knot here, right? So the first thing it does is the force mode starts on. And then after a set amount of time, this signal goes high and it which turns off the force mode. Yeah. Um anyway, that's not too important. I'm going to end the recording. Yeah. Cool. Um.